Hello and a very warm welcome to this latest edition of Talking Germany. And my guest today is a very special woman indeed. Uh, she's a journalist, philosopher and writer who reports, reflects and writes with great passion and originality on themes that include war and war crimes, cultural identity and terrorism, suffering and speechlessness, dance and desire and much, much more besides. Now here she is in person, Caroline Imke. Thank you very much for joining us here today on Talking Germany. It's wonderful to have you here. It's a pleasure. Excellent. Now, uh, I could list some or all of the universities that Caroline has been attached to, the prizes that she's won, the publications that she's written for, but I think the most important thing to tell you is this, that Caroline Emka is uh, uh, an explorer, an explorer of both the real and the imaginary worlds, and I'm sure she is going to be a fascinating guest. Caroline, I just described you as an explorer. How do you describe yourself? <laughs> I don't know if I would have used that term, uh, but I'm a traveller, I would say. Uh, that would be correct. And indeed, I think uh, what described wonderfully is that I enjoy travelling and exploring um, other countries, but also the imaginary landscapes uh, of literature or theory. Exactly. That's the, that's the fascinating thing about you, that you, you do. You explore these very real places that have maps, that have borders, that have conflicts. And then you explore the world of the imagination. Tell me where the two come together. Well, I think every trip that you make, every um, country that you travel to already... Um, I mean, it's already on your mind prior to going. Um, so there is an imaginary landscape, there's an imaginary map that I have mm -hmm. before travelling to Iraq or Gaza or Afghanistan. Uh, and of course they match at the moment when you arrive and you realise that oh, it's not at all <laughs> what I thought it was like. Um, they match, I think, also in the narration uh, of the people that I talk to. Uh, the way they remember the past, uh, the way they dream uh, and hope for a better future. Um, there is also always this imaginary realm. And I think it is as important to see and witness that as to see and witness, uh, you know, what's happening in uh, a country that's haunted by a wall and uh, mm. violence. You initially trained, I think that's the word to use, as a, as a philosopher, and you've become a journalist. Yes, I learned something decent uh, <laughs> before well, I degenerated into a philosopher. Well, tell me this, I mean, okay, you learned something decent, you learned philosophy, yeah? You came from a sort of a very well-established middle-class background, I think it's fair to say. You know, why philosophy? Did your parents not put pressure on you to study medicine or the law or something like that? Um, actually, my father hadn't studied at all, so I think, ah. first of all, I had to establish that I would study, yeah. uh, I think that was scary enough. Mm -hmm. um, and then the fact that I wanted to study philosophy, evidently, um, you know, wasn't to the great um, uh, joy of my father. Mm -hmm. um, and my mother, I think, uh, very early realised that um, I was happy when reading books. And as a wonderful mother, all my mother wanted was that this uh, slightly bizarre child uh, would be happy. So she approved uh, whatever I wanted to do and followed very, very closely then my studies. OK, so the books led to philosophy. The philosophy then led on to journalism. I know you still do philosophy. You write philosophy. You teach philosophy. Um, You've talked about your travels and your encounters with people. Now, what, what, what becomes clear to me when I look at your career so far is that you've, you've confronted yourself an awful lot with war zones, with areas of conflict, with, with suffering and dislocation. Why specifically that? Why have you confronted yourself with all this? To some extent, I mean, not to sound rude, I mean, one reply would be, why not? Um, I, I, I find it slightly... Um, strange that nowadays uh, people are surprised uh, when you make a decision to lead um, a life that is dedicated to the lives uh, of others. Okay, but then why um, not? But then you write about it? What are you trying to achieve by writing about it? Um, I think... Um, the f I think the first moment is it's just uh, it's a more reflex, it's an impulse. Mm -hmm. uh, it's nothing special. I just see like any other um, you know person who watches television, I see images of people suffering, people in need. Um, I happen to have a profession um, 
that is um, you know, able to finance a trip to these areas, I happen to have a gift uh, that is um, describing what I see uh, and forming it uh, into language. Um, and then I think one of the key experiences that I think every war reporter has made, and I'm sure every war reporter could uh, say the same, is that whenever you travel to a refugee camp and you speak to victims of violence, of um, uh, you know, victims of um, exclusion, uh, what they do is they don't beg you for practical help. They don't beg for money. They don't beg for you know taking them uh, with you. But they beg you to write that down. They beg you to write down that story. So um, I, th I think I never ever question what I'm doing after the first such experience. The first time I was in a refugee camp in Albania during the Kosovo crisis, and people were asking me to give testimony um, of what they were suffering. It was, um, you know, it was without doubt that this is what I would be doing um, for as long as I would be allowed to do it. What a life, great life so far. <laughs> Much more to come. Uh, I'd like to go back to your early days. And a, a couple of years ago, two years ago, you published a book called How We Desire, you know, which I read and it made a great impression on me, I have to say. And almost in a sort of, in a, in a relative clause in that book, almost in passing, you talked about having difficulties at home when, when you were a youngster. And I don't want to pry into, you know, what happened when you, when you were a child, a child, but I would like to ask you the question, were you, were you a handful for your parents? Were you a rebel? Um, thank God you don't ask that question to my father. Um, <laughs> um, no, I don't know if I was a rebel. That I mean, you know, I, I, I guess intellectuals, uh, you know, in, enjoy presenting themselves as the great rebels. Uh, no, I don't think I was. But um, I think I was um, a bit too serious probably for the taste uh, of my father. And yeah. I think he rather had the idea that, um, I don't know, uh, that women and um, books uh, did not necessarily belong to the same world, let's put it mildly. Um, we're, back on, we're back on the theme of books here, yeah. I'm going to yeah. go back to your book. There was one it was, I mean, if, if I may add one thing, I think it was definitely more about the question of intellectuality or, 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 or sophistication or the joy of, uh, of reading than about homosexuality. So that wasn't the, the, the big contentious mm -hmm. uh, issue uh, mm -hmm. at home. It was really more about... Um, yeah, I think my father was worried that, um, and I, I don't know, I think that people who read weren't necessarily good human beings in his understanding. In the book that I just mentioned, there is one passage, and again, this was when I read the book, it was one of those passages, one of those lines that I underlined. There's a scene when you were at school, and a young boy, a teenage boy, is being maltreated by some other boys. You're nodding, you know the scene. Mm -hmm. There's a teacher involved as well, which makes it all the worse. And you're sort of on the fringe of this scene and you don't intervene. Yeah. And the sentence goes something like, I will never let this happen again. I will never let something like this go unsaid again. Yeah. I will bear witness. Yeah. That was a very important moment for you. Yeah, um, it's uh, tragic. I would say there's been other, other uh, moments, I think, that we all remember from going to school is uh, where kids were being stigmatised or excluded or mocked um, or mistreated by others. I mean, there's this, there's this uh, you know, really, really unfortunate... Uh, way of uh, including uh, some and excluding others that we all, I think, experience in different rituals. And this particular scene was one scene where um, one boy was being mistreated. And um, I think at the m in the situation, it wasn't quite clear whether it was just fun or whether it was already violence. Mm -hmm. I thought it was definitely abuse. I thought so at the time. I thought um, it was horrific. Um, and yet I didn't 
intervene. I just walked away. I was disgusted. Mm. Um, and I never forgave myself. You were speechless. The, the, that's the word, I was, I, uh, that was yes, the word you I was used in the book. I was speechless. Um, I was, I think, also shocked. I mean, I think I was, to some extent, probably really shocked at what was happening. Yeah. And I think the shock led to my inability to act, I mean, to just act. Um, and I, you know, one never knows whether one uh, uh, would have this happen to oneself again or not. Uh, but I just hope that it, uh, you know, that I don't stand by. A couple of years, let, let's move on just a little bit. And I think 1989, I think you were, not, you were 22 years old and a shocking event in your life. Alfred Herrhausen, then chairman of Deutsche Bank, was killed in, an, in a terror attack by the Red Army faction. He was a very close friend of your family. Mm -hmm. He was somebody who was very important to you. You viewed him as effectively a godfather mm -hmm. for you. Mm -hmm. That too had a very great impression on you. And, and, and I sense led to your lifelong preoccupation with violence and what do you do with the, the use and the exercising of violence? Um, yes and no. Yes and no. Um, I think uh, you're, you're absolutely right. It had an enormous effect. I mean, it, you know, a person who, you know, uh, whom you love uh, is, uh, is murdered uh, by a terrorist group. Um, by the way, I mean, I mean, whose actors uh, were never found. I mean, nobody was ever indicted for that crime. We still don't know who committed this crime, uh, which is indeed uh, haunting uh, for the whole life because somehow you can't really imagine, and you, ca you can't come to terms with it anyway, but you, I think in particular you can't come to terms with it if the perpetrators were never... The cliche is there's no closure. There can be no closure. Indeed. I mean, there is no closure. I think so, so in that sense, you're right. I mean, that was a transformative, uh, traumatic uh, loss. Um, the, you know, the preoccupation uh, with uh, violence, I, don't, I think that uh, existed prior uh, to this um, attack. I think in my case, it um, has one very, very simple, banal, uh, roots probably in my character is I just can't stand injustice and it's very very banal and nothing special uh, moral reflex or, or impulse just to respond to a person in need you know full stop that that's quite simple but the other one I think is um, I'm a German uh, and I'm you know of a post-war generation that hasn't experienced war uh, in my lifetime in Germany um, but whose entire moral and political formation uh, had one reference point, and that was the Shoah and uh, the reflection on National Socialism. And I think uh, if you ask me about what is sort of, you know, the motif or, or, or the impulse behind travelling to war zones and caring about victims of violence, I think it's much more informed and... Yeah, emotionally nurtured, I think, by this sense of responsibility for um, this inheritance. You knew her, Anja Niedringhaus. Yeah, you were friends, I, th I believe. What can you tell us about her? Um, first of all, that's a great loss. Um, for everyone who knew her, but I think also for the public uh, who couldn't know her but somehow knew her maybe a little bit through the images. Mm -hmm. uh, she was uh, an extremely uh, passionate, uh, uh, wonderfully funny also person with a great love for Afghanistan, which is what makes this murder of hers in Afghanistan said so tragic. Um, I mean, you would say uh, if somebody kills uh, somebody else, uh, you know, it's, it's always wrong. But in this case, it was uh, totally absurd. Mm. Did you, you, you must have talked to her about the kind of dangers that ultimately led to her death and the kind of dangers that you and her will have found yourselves in. Did you Actually, we didn't talk about that at all because I think we why both not, why knew. Why not? I, I think because it was such a... 
part of our lives um, that I think it was much less an issue for us than for others who don't travel to these areas. What did the, the circumstances of, of her killing, what did they tell us about the dangers of war reporting? Because my sense is that I, you know, when, when, I, when I look at the, the, the details, she was killed because she was from the West? She was killed because she was a woman from the West? Um, we don't know for sure. Um, to some extent, um, uh, I would always say, uh, look, if you can't do what Anya did in this particular situation, then you can't, you know, then you can't travel to these areas uh, because, uh, you know, this was, uh, you know, convoy uh, during the elections. Uh, you know, she wasn't all by herself. I mean, it was everything about this was, so to speak, normal if there is such a thing as normalcy in Afghanistan, and yet it happens. Uh, but this is what can happen in such areas, and you know that prior to going. Um, and she knew that risk. Um, Okay, let's talk about let's talk about you as a war reporter, a war correspondent. That's how you've described yourself a couple of times already in in the program. I've been a little bit surprised because I, I have heard you in the past saying, "No, that is precisely what I am not. I'm not a war correspondent, a war reporter, because I'm not reporting on combatants and conflict yeah. and military logistics or whatever. I'm reporting on something very different." Yeah, indeed. I mean, to some extent, at some point, you just accept the term that people use for the kind of job. And so I accept that it's called war reporter. Um, just, I would say, indeed, you're right. I'm not particularly interested in sort of the military aspect uh, of a war. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't write about soldiers. I don't go embedded. Uh, if there's any way uh, I can avoid it. Uh, I'm interested in civilians and how war penetrates an entire society and an area where civilians, you know, women, children and young and old men uh, live who are victims of such um, violence uh, haunting uh, their area. And so that is, I think, I think what I care about is to go to those people and make them heard um, and give them a voice. What special skills do you have? What, what, what aspects of your personality do you have that help people to to really articulate their sufferings? I'm usually not well dressed. Um, uh, I love food. I can sleep well. Um, no, what I guess you mean something. I mean, I, I, would, I, you know, I wouldn't underestimate what I've just said. Um, sure. But um, no, I think in general, it's just uh, I don't tend to be scared of strangers. Uh, I, you have that fearlessness from your mother. I understand. Uh, yes, uh, she, my... she taught it to you, or you saw it in her. No, you could just see. You could just see it. Mm. My mother was just uh, very, very warm uh, mm. and open person, and uh, trusted that nobody would possibly want to harm her. What a wonderful thing to pass on to her daughter. Uh, yeah. Yes, you know, I feel very, very, very grateful for oh. having that. Okay, let's get back to the, there is, because this is very, it's a very serious thing that we're talking about here. When I, before I came in, I, I wrote down just sort of from the top of my head, Kate Aidy, Marie Colvin, Martha Gellhorn, I could go on with a long list of female war correspondents, war reporters, there's you. Yeah. What, what is, because the cliche is that many people will have is something like somebody like Ernest Hemingway or what have you. Yeah, it's, a hard it's drinking, a tough drunk, guy. exactly. Exactly. Uh, yeah. Impotent, uh, divorced. How uh, is it different male. for women? Look, I mean, to some extent, I would say I don't particularly, I mean, I don't really re necessarily reflect on that all day long. Um, one is, um, I find it an advantage because in many uh, Islamic countries that I've traveled to, uh, we have different zones and areas where only men or only women are allowed uh, to be. I get access to that half of the population sure. <laughs> uh, that men don't necessarily get access to. And of course, I also get then ac you know, access or, uh, to their stories. And I think they probably uh, have more trust uh, or are less scared to speak about harms uh, uh, and about suffering and about certain forms of violence, maybe sexual violence, uh, that they had to endure. Um, so to some extent, it's, an, it's there, it's an advantage. 
Um, then also in some countries where they don't necessarily respect uh, their own women, um, I get uh, extra good treatment because they want to prove um, that you know they can treat women well. Um, no, I, I, you know, I haven't ever experienced as as a disadvantage. Um, it's rather, I would say, complicated uh, to be gay and to travel to areas where gays are still criminalized, <laughs> and where it's yeah. so tabooed yeah. that you know there, there aren't even words mm. uh, for that way to desire and love. You are. We'll talk about the gayness in a in, in a moment. <laughs> yeah. We must, yeah. Uh, I'd just like to ask you, you're somebody who's, who has taught and thought a lot about how journalism is done. Mm -hmm. In situations where massacres are taking place, where perhaps even genocide is taking place, what happens to objectivity? Well, I'm not a great fan of this um, myth of... The myth of objectivity. Uh, ..of objectivity or of you know, the distant um, reporter. Um, not because I want to be biased, not because I think one should, you know, speculate or invent uh, stories, of course not. But because I think in war zones, um, it's very, very, very difficult to pretend that you're not affected yourself. Of course I'm a human being, of course I'm formed and conditioned by my background. Uh, I'm white, uh, I'm not black, I'm very conscious about the fact that I'm white. Mm -hmm. um, I'm a female, as you've said, you know, I'm being perceived as something. Actually very often I'm not even uh, perceived as a female because in the countries I travel to women <laughs> don't look the way I look. Um, so I would say, uh, you know, I'm... Uh, I'm a subjective but hopefully very reflective reporter. And in case of genocides or war crimes, um, I have to be uh, with a bias towards human rights. I have to be able to call, to give it a name. I mean, I have to call it, this is a war crime. I'm glad you said that, yeah. I think it's a good anchor for all journalists to be aware of human principles of human rights. Well, I have to, have, the, I mean, I have to have some norm. I have to have some norm by which to judge, and that's international human rights. Absolutely. Now, Carolyn uh, Imker has, uh, together with the filmmaker Angelina Maceroni, been involved in the making of a series of short films about tolerance. Tolerance uh, specifically of homosexual, transgender and intergender people. Uh, the films, which are called Tolerant, We Are Tolerant, uh, set out to turn the whole idea of tolerance on its head. Louise! Do you really feel me? Darf ich heute bei Maxi schlafen? Ach, heute nicht, Louise. Bitte. Du weißt doch, wir haben das nicht so gern, wenn du so oft bei denen bist. Aber das ist mein bester Freund. Wir haben ja auch nichts gegen Maxi. Der kann gar mit zu uns kommen. Und Maxis Eltern. Ich hab's einfach lieber, wenn ihr bei uns spielt. Und. Maxi tut das auch ganz gut, wenn er mal ein anderes Umfeld kennenlernt. Frag doch mal deine Eltern, ob du mitkommen kannst zu uns. Nein. Aber Maxis Katze hat Junge gekriegt. Ich will die kleinen Katzen sehen. Na gut. Aber nicht mit übernachten, okay? Ich guck's und du kannst ja auch mal was sagen. Ich weiß nicht, ob ich das so gut finde, dass unser Kind ständig bei diesen Leuten ist. 200.000, 200.000 sind das habe ich doch gesagt. Wenn irgendwas ist, dann ruf an, Luise, okay? Nein, was kriegt sie denn da für Werte vorgelegt? Ja, wir fangen bei 500.000 an und dann muss ich dir das jetzt wirklich alles noch erklären. Ich sag dir, Meier weiß es nicht. Der geht von 300.000 aus. I'd like to say something completely banal because it's a serious subject, but the, uh, you look... I'm, no, my feeling is that you had a lot of fun while you were making this. Uh, that's not banal. We indeed <laughs> had lots of fun. Uh, I have to say uh, thanks to Angelina Macarone, uh, mm -hmm. who directed uh, these spots. Uh, no, we tremendously enjoyed uh, ourselves. 
Tell me in your own words, however, what you were trying to achieve, because the message is quite important. Uh, well, what we were trying to say was, I mean, I mean there's not just in Germany, but all over Europe, um, there's a remaining uh, discrepancy uh, between the rights of heterosexuals and the rights of LGBTI. Um, and what we wanted to add to the discourse was something that uh, would, you know, of course, produce laughter and have people enjoy watching these spots, but at the same time um, show that tolerance um, and the discourse is about tolerance is always asymmetrical. Tolerance is always regulating aversion. It's always of a majority that looks down on others and, you know, gives that tolerance. And I think what we were very serious about was we don't want to justify um, that we're gay or we don't want to beg for our rights. You don't want to be tolerated. Indeed. No, I, I want, you know, respect. Uh, mm. I, you know, I, I, I don't mind, uh, you know, straight people. Uh, <laughs> I just mind that they um, think they can give or not give rights to gays. Uh -huh. And so I think that's what we wanted. We wanted to show there's always, mm -hmm. you know, an asymmetry and we wanted to reverse this and wanted to subvert a little bit that discourse on tolerance yeah. by having people change their perspective and suddenly seeing uh, everything from a different angle. I think they're all, all three are very good films and, uh, and you can watch them on YouTube and they, they've been, yes. on the, they've been in, the, in the movie theatres here in Berlin. I recommend that people do click onto them and have a, have a look. Please. What kind of impact have they had? Uh, any, can you measure it in any way? Of your, what sort of response has there been? Uh, well, we had lovely, I mean, really, really had lovely responses. I mean, one has to say it's three very different, they, they, they attack sort of different aspects of the discourse on tolerance. Um, of course, we had people laugh, we had people being irritated. Uh, mm -hmm. Of course, they also uh, don't just show uh, the question of tolerance, but of course they show intolerance. So we also had people say, oh, we're not that intolerant. Uh, <laughs> and uh, I think it's a nice way to see that um, you can actually still interfere in the public sphere, even though this is a topic that has been addressed and approached, you know, many, many times. And you were, you were involved uh, earlier this year in another intervention in the, in the public debate, in the public discourse, when you, you were one of two people who interviewed Thomas Hitzelsberger, the, the, the soccer player. You know? Yes. Very good soccer player, played for the German national team, played in England, played in Italy, played here in Germany, and, uh, and he came out. He became the highest profile soccer player in the world to come out. Yeah? Uh, at the time, I, I, I had a look at the interview the other day again, and the, right at the beginning he says what he wanted to do was to help to move the public debate in Germany forward. Did it, the interview the courage that he had to intervene? Uh, I think so. I mean, first of all, um, I think just the act of coming out, um, one has to say voluntarily, I mean, he wasn't hunted down mm. by the yellow press. Mm. Uh, uh, he himself made that decision. Um, so I think already that was a huge uh, act, just, the, you know, the, just to, for young, I think, uh, soccer players to see someone they all admired, mm. Uh, uh, have the courage to do it. Of course, I would say, of course, we all want a society where it doesn't take courage. Uh, <laughs> exactly. I, you know, uh, uh, of course, to some extent, you would want to say, so what's the big deal? Mm. And yet, it is a big deal. Mm. It is a big deal in that sports world. Um, and I think what has changed is uh, that uh, the public response to this was overwhelmingly uh, positive. I mean, yeah. Angela Merkel had... Uh, her speaker comment, uh, his coming out, David Cameron uh, responded. Uh, and if we remember, I mean, there was an English soccer player many, many years ago who did uh, come out also. And, Just in fashion uh, Yes. Mm -hmm. And that was a tragic... It really was. Uh, it was a horrible really, episode. Really, really, really yeah. horrible episode. So, of course, we as journalists also were really worried. We, we, we you know, you... you, you couldn't really foresee how the public response would be. And so the fact that there was such an overwhelmingly positive response to this, of course, gives hope uh, that, you know, next time, hopefully, it will be someone who's still actively playing. Lots of active female international players play for Germany have come out. 
Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. See? We don't have time to... We're going to move on to our next yeah, topic yeah. of discussion, but just give me a very, very quick answer from what you know or you don't know from your insider circles. Yeah. Are there gay players in the German men's national team? Uh, I have no clue. OK. <laughs> Enough on the subject, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, Berlin, the city where we are broadcasting from, has a host of excellent theatres. One of the most exciting, which this lady is uh, involved with, is the Maxim Gorky Theatre. Uh, it's in what used to be East Berlin, and the theatre, named for the uh, Russian writer Maxim Gorky, was originally dedicated to promoting Russian and Soviet theatre. These days, the focus is very different, as we find out now. Shermaine Longhoff is the artistic director of Berlin's Maxim Gorky Theatre. Since November 2013, she and Jens Hilje have been in charge of the small state theatre in the German capital. Moving from off-theatre to a municipal stage is exciting. Longhoff is also the country's first Turkish-German artistic director. She has a new ensemble, new ideas, and she's created a space for everyone in the city, whatever their origins. The ensemble is international. It's about who people are, rather than about the migration stories in their backgrounds. We've decided everyone here has a background in vibration. They're all vibrating, hyperactive, and want to get on stage. The theater mirrored life in the city when the season opened with Chekhov's Cherry Orchard. Director Nurkan Erpolat portrayed the Russian rural gentry as Berlin partygoers. We've got a city with hundreds of different milieus, the kind that develop in a city like this. The political scene, the artists, students, intellectuals, the different communities and ethnic groups. What I want to do is present a program and tell stories that appeal to every one of them. Shermaine Longhoff thinks in political terms. She wants to use the theater to influence people, at least a bit. But she can't do that alone. She wants to get the public excited and attract new audiences. A muezzin recites Germany's constitution. That got attention and was one of 32 performances celebrating the reopening of the Max and Gorky Theater. The approach seems to be working. 95% of the theater's seats are filled. The Maxim Gorky Theatre, it's an exciting place, and we're carrying the report because you are involved with the theatre and the people. <laughs> somewhat, yes. Yeah, well, do, well, tell me, what, the, what does the somewhat amount to? Uh, well, I'm a great fan uh, of the programme. Mm -hmm. uh, I know some of the actors uh, who are in the ensemble of the Gorky, and I know the uh, co-director, uh, Jens Hillier, very well. He's a good friend of mine. Oh, yeah. And I know Shami Langhoff, of course, and I think they, the two together, they really rock the city. OK. And you're being very modest about your connection with the theatre because it was it was the, the theatre was completely revamped and got and took a new start a couple of months ago and you were the person who was given the job of holding a sort of a major keynote address at the function. Yeah. Yes. Uh, it was interesting. I know because I've read it. I wasn't there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> tell yeah. us what tell us what you said. What I mean, no. The, the really I have to say the really really funny thing was when they asked me would you like to do the keynote. They didn't really say keynote, mm -hmm. but they said, look, you know, we would want someone. Uh, to from the outside to speak at the opening uh, of uh, the theater and we would ask you to speak about what your wishes are mm -hmm. and I thought oh fantastic I they actually asking me uh, to say you know you should play Beckett which is, <laughs> I so I, 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 I thought I, I, I could imagine what kind of I, I could wish you know and unfortunately that's not what they meant mm -hmm. um, and uh, no, and then I basically, I think I, at, at some extent, spoke as a Berliner uh, uh, and said... Which is I'm, what you are. Yeah, yeah, and said I'm deeply, deeply moved that these young, um, act, young and old actors uh, who, who have a background from all over the world, uh, who used to already be at, you know, off seen theatres yeah. prior to going to the Gorky, yeah. so that those from the periphery 
that they are now in the city centre and... Uh, what you're talking about is what, is what they call at the theatre post-migrant yes. theatre. Yes. Can you define that for me in sort of two sure. sentences? Uh, in German, there's this totally bizarre... It's term. an important movement in Germany now uh, and it's yes, having a I mean, real impact. I, I, I yeah. mean, yes. I mean, Stuart Hall once said identity is an uh, you know, endless open question and, and conversation. Mm -hmm. And to some extent, I think that is what they relate to. They say, yes, we have these roots, mm -hmm. uh, or we have this family history of, um, uh, you know, parents or grandparents who, who came to Germany. Uh, and yet they also want to transcend that and yeah. they want to work with these experiences, but don't make them their sole core identity. But that sounds to me, because I'm talking to you as the philosopher now, uh, the, there's been too little of the philosopher on the show. There's been, a, you know, we talked a lot about the war reporter and the author. The, 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 in this speech, you called for, uh, because what you're saying is, you know, there's a lot of diversity of human experience and a lot of it is, is now happening here in Germany, which is a great thing. Uh, but in, in your address, as I understood it, you said there is too much difference and you want more similarity. I think yes. that's how you put it. What was the similarity? That sounds almost as though we need to have core values here in Germany. You sound like a conservative. Um, <laughs> oh, God, that's scary. No, I think what I meant was that um, there is a form of discourse on identity and difference that um, tends to sound a little bit too essentialistic. Um, and I mean, evidently, I mean, you, you, you called, or you called, called talking German and not, t I mean, the German version talking is Germany. called. The German typical. version of our show here on DW is called different... Typisch Deutsch, typical oh, okay, German. Okay, okay, because I, I just wanted to say, uh, <laughs> you know, you call it typically German and, you know, that, that is, you, you ask, well, what is typical? Yeah. And what is a real German? Yeah. And what's a real migrant? And what's yep. a real Muslim? So I, what I think is, if you want to be as artists successful, mm. then you have to, of course, make reference to these backgrounds and these identities, and yet, you know, subvert them, transform them, um, and use them as material for then artistic and aesthetic expression. And that, I think, is what then enables you to also find an audience that doesn't have that same background, but yet can somehow see some resemblances or similarities uh, to their own emotions and lives. Thank you <laughs> very much for those thoughts and thank you very much in general for sharing your thoughts with us uh, today. You're most welcome. Thanks for having me. Great stuff. That is your lot with the sometimes controversial, always compelling Caroline Imker. If you've enjoyed her company as much as I have, then do come back next week. Until then, bye-bye and tschüss. <laughs>